morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Simon Hawker. Uh, I'm really excited to be here this morning. Uh, actually, a couple months ago when I received the email uh, from Ted inviting me to speak, I was uh, so excited, I jumped up from my computer. Uh, nobody else was in the house except my father. Um, I said, Pa, I got accept I invited to speak at a TED conference. He said, a what? <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, TED Talks. And Imagine the next 10 minutes trying to explain a TED talk to somebody who thinks the internet's a conspiracy. It's not going to go over so well, but uh, a couple days ago when he saw that Christopher uh, McDougall was speaking, he flipped out. And um, he, he read Chris's book a few months ago and had, a, I think, a near religious experience. Um, uh, I found him in North Norbert's train station uh, one morning, handing out Born to Run tracks trying to tell people that when you're 62, you can run as fast as when you're 19. So uh, um, my father's a huge fan. And uh, most of you have probably heard of Chris. Uh, but uh, you may not have heard of me in, in my work. You might be wondering <laughs> why they invited uh, Simon Paul to speak. I'm not quite sure, but I'm really excited to be here. And, um, and I'm glad that I have your attention for the next 15 minutes. So a little bit about myself. I, uh, I went to school in Philadelphia. I grew up in Philly. I uh, attended public school there, and I, uh, I graduated from Drexel in 1993 in electrical engineering. Um, Drexel has a co-op program, so my last year at Drexel, I was working at General Electric um, as an engineer. And uh, as most college students, we kind of grapple with the meaning of life, or black holes really black. Um, and I had my own little religious experience, and, I'm aware this is Saturday morning and not Sunday, so I won't, I'll spare you the details about that experience, but um, I think it's important because it changed my career direction. I really felt like I was freed up to think about um, what I was passionate about. If I could do anything, what would it be? Strangely enough, uh, I landed on an inner city high school teacher, a big switch from engineering, and um, I found my dream coming true in 1996. I started teaching math and science at West Philadelphia High School. Now, um, West Philly is famous for fires and fights and, and uh, people being shot, unfortunately. Uh, and so, uh, but as a young teacher, that was not really daunting. Um, you know, most young teachers come in, we're enthusiastic, we're energetic, we're arrogant, we think that we can change the world, and, uh, and my first year was really humbling. Um, a couple things happened to me my first year. I started to, to learn more about what good teaching and learning looked like. Uh, I was working with two auto shop teachers that year, and they were by far the most brilliant men I've ever worked with. They uh, were smarter than the engineers I worked with at GE. And yet, if you sat them in a desk in a row, or in this auditorium, they would go nuts. They couldn't sit still. Their intelligence was exhibited in a different way. Um, and so this idea of multiple intelligence was starting to come to life to me, that we're all smart in different ways. And unfortunately, <coughs> schools are one size fit all. And so as a young teacher, I was trying to make sense of that. The other thing I was trying to make sense of was the disconnect between what should have been going on in school and what was actually going on. If you would wander into any urban high school, I think most people would be shocked. Um, and so as a young teacher trying to, to sort these things out, I, I created this after school program. And at the time, I didn't realize why I created that after school program. Uh, in retrospect, it was to preserve my own, my own sanity, my own sanity too, <laughs> and, um, and try to make sense of, of these things that uh, didn't make sense at the time. And so uh, we started off small. We had, uh, first year, I had students build a, an electric go kart. Um, it was a science fair project. My students <coughs> went to the Philadelphia Science Fair, and they actually won second place. The following year, they wanted to do something bigger, so um, they designed uh, an electric car Jeep, and they did a research project on electric versus gasoline. Um, they won the Philadelphia Science Fair with that with that vehicle, um, and then the following year, we decided to look for a bigger competition, and we found a national competition for alternative fuel vehicles called the Tour de Soul. They converted that Saturn to electric power. We were the first team of color in this national competition. It was a five-day road rally from New York City to Washington, D.C. And when I look back on those first three years, um, I, I learned a lot. The students learned a lot. And we were learning about different ways of learning. Um, two years later, we were back at the Tour de Sol. The students had gotten the sack while they painted it orange, so um, they felt like uh, 
It was better. And they also had refined it to the point where it was getting 180 miles per gallon equipment. This is back in 2002. Um, that was the Jeep. Uh, they designed an aerodynamic uh, lightweight body. Except the Jeep's not lightweight, but it was still a good attempt. And they made it a biodiesel plug-in hybrid. Eight years ago, um, my students were thinking about biodiesels and plug-in hybrids. So uh, we somehow miraculously won the competition that year. We beat 40 other teams from around the country. We beat MIT. And um, we felt like. She didn't respond that way. <laughs> so we felt like we could do anything. And it's funny, as teachers, we often tell our students you can do anything. And as adults, we know that there's limits in life. Thankfully, we started to believe our own hype, and we really went away believing we could do anything. And we challenged the kids to think about what's next. Now, these are my students. They're West Philly students. They hadn't been outside the city before going on the Tour de Soul. And yet, they saw the Honda Insight and Toyota, Toyota Prius at the Tour de Soul in 2002. And they knew that hybrid vehicles were the next technology. GM didn't get it then, but West Philly kids got it. And so they said, you know what, but there's something missing. If we really want hybrids to catch on, we've got to do something different. And so it takes kids' uh, ability to think outside the box and adults to try to make it a reality. And when we put those two things together, they said, let's make a badass hybrid sports car. Now, those two words don't usually go together, but uh, <laughs> for teenagers, that's what they do. <laughs> extremely fast, gets over 60 miles to the gallon, and it's earth friendly. And by 2005, we went back to the Tour de Sol. Uh, we won. Uh, we were back in 2006. Um, St. Um, and, and we won again. In 2007, we won another smaller competition. And in 2008, the X Prize had announced a $10 million competition to develop 100 miles per gallon vehicles. No problem, you can do 180 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> sign up. There was a catch though. The X Prize required a business plan showing that you could produce 10,000 cars a year. So, we partnered with Drexel University, and at the same time, the automotive industry in the country was falling apart. Uh, so, the students said, well, let's make cars based on American technology. And how can we make a car that's uh, that can be sold. What are the big requirements? It has to be safe, it has to be affordable, and it has to be attractive. And so, using those limits, uh, we developed these two vehicles. Um, <coughs> 111 teams from around the world entered the competition. We were the only high school that was uh, permitted to into the competition uh, initially. And so, over the course of the next two years, and series after series of eliminations, uh, we found ourselves in the semifinals this summer, alongside Aptera and other multi-million dollar companies. MIT had been eliminated again. <laughs> uh, now we have gone. Tesla uh, was gone. They're on the front of Wired magazine just recently. And and so the reason I say that is not to to um, I, I wanted to build a context to just explain how complex this competition was. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't proceed to the finals. Only 11 teams made it to the finals. But um, we were taken as serious competitors. And so and as I look back over the last 13 years of everything I've learned, uh, I think there's a few big takeaways. Um, first of all, when kids are given an opportunity, you, can, you never know what they're capable of doing. Um, I've learned a crap load about hybrid technology. I've put my 10,000 hours in. Um, and I'm really thankful because to do that, you have to have somebody to support you. So I want to take an opportunity to thank my wife who's here with me today um, for giving me the 10,000 hours. Um, but more so than learning about hybrid technology, um, we learned a lot more about what works in urban education. Urban education is in crisis. It's a hot topic right now. If you've taught in the city, you know that in any large urban district, 50% of the students are dropping out. Of the 50% that graduate, 15% are on grade level. And as a teacher, on the front lines, that's not emotionally sustainable. 
Um, among all the other ramifications, uh, it's, it's just as a teacher you can't you can't you can't do that. Um, and there's better ways to do education. We learn giving kids projects embraces their multiple intelligence. We've learned that uh, if you give kids real projects to do, their creativity comes out, their problem-solving skills come out. They think of wonderful ideas. But you need to make space to do that. Um, so why don't districts do it? It's messy. It's complex to keep track of. It's much easier just to continue to pound content and have kids take standardized tests. So one thing I want to say is when I start to talk about project-based learning, people start to think or hear that um, I'm not for basic skills. And people that do authentic work with kids are definitely for basic skills. You have to be able to read and do math and write. But the, the standard way is not working. We're, we're producing, even at our best schools, we're producing test takers, not critical thinkers. And so to illustrate this point, this is the point where you get to uh, interact. Uh, to illustrate this point, I'm going to give you a quick quiz. Uh, high stakes test, zero or 100. All right. Now, so follow my logic for a second. Uh, if you have graduated high school, I'm assuming everybody here has graduated high school, except a few of the young folks. Uh, if you are in the other category, don't pay attention to anything I'm about to say. Um, uh, but for those who have graduated high school, um, you took algebra two. And if you took algebra two, there's one main concept. There's a lot. There's tons of stuff in algebra two, but there's one main concept. You all did the quadratic form. All right, so here's the quiz. You ready? Hurry up. I don't have much time. <laughs> All right, we'll be on the honor system. How many people could solve that? All right, less than 50%. You guys aren't doing as well as the urban high school to teach that. Uh, All right, more importantly, how many people could explain what that answer means? Let's say, fabulous, I've got somebody here. Math teacher, math student. Uh, economics, professor. economics professor. How many <laughs> solutions will we get? Two. two. And what do they represent? Uh, two solutions to the, I guess two if I put it on a graph, what would they represent? The uh, x-intercept. The x-intercept. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> According to that function, when you're 40, so I'm right at my feet, thank God. Um, so, so this obsession with content, name the 50 states, all these things we're forced to memorize. We get stuck there, and we don't move to the next step to allow children to develop critical thinking skills, to engage the different talents they bring, and so much is lost. So, uh, these are just a few snapshots of my kids doing a variety of projects. Um, so if I can leave you with one thing to take away, my dream is to start a school next. There's lots of schools in this country that are working. They're doing fabulous work with kids, and we need more of it. Philadelphia is desperate for schools that are project-based, that develop, that develop basic skills, but to move past that and develop truly critical thinking skills. If you have an opportunity, um, check out our website. Um, you can ask a vote in support of our school. Uh, it takes a few seconds, and uh, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to close with uh, last week, we were down in Washington, D.C. for the XPRIZE finale. We unexpectedly got invited to the White House, and uh, we were able to participate in uh, a press conference with the President, so I'm going to give the President the last few words. Thank you very much. <laughs> face some tough challenges, it's that potential that ought to give us hope. We need no better example than the students who are here today from West Philadelphia High School. <laughs> These students have been by some terrific teachers entered a global competition against serious corporate and college challengers to build a production-ready car that runs on very little fuel. So as part of an after-school program, they work to get their vehicles ready. They tweaked the hybrid engine, they figured out how to make the cars run more efficiently. At first, the adults didn't really think their team had a chance, admit it. <laughs> but then something strange happened. 
Where older and more seasoned teams failed, they succeeded, even making it through an elimination round. Now, they didn't win the competition. You know, they're kids, come on. <laughs> but they did build a car that got more than 65 miles per gallon. They went toe-to-toe -to -toe with car companies and big-name universities. <laughs> went against big-name universities, well-funded rivals. They held their own. They didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have the best equipment. They certainly didn't have every advantage in life. What they had was a program to challenge them to solve problems and work together to learn and build and create. And that's the kind of spirit and ingenuity that we have to foster. That's the potential that we can harness all across America. That's what will help our young people to fulfill their promise, to realize their dreams, and to help this nation succeed in the years to come. Uh, and I, I, I just have to editorialize. This uh, is the kind of thing that just isn't going to get a lot of attention initially. This will not lead the nightly news. You won't see this on uh, the cover of Roll Call or Politico. Uh, it's not, doesn't have conflict and uh, uh, controversy behind it. But, but these are actually the kinds of things that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we're going to look back and say this is something that made a difference. Well, this may be a difficult time for our nation, and we face some tough challenges. It's that potential that ought to give us hope. We need no better example than the students who are here today for our class.